I continue the systematic commentary of the preface <coughs> to the first edition of the science of logic and in this video I will comment only one sentence but it might be the most important uh, to understand Hegel because honestly uh, I try to think with my limited capabilities and this is where I reach my limit because it is really difficult and thinking is a serious <coughs> business and uh, I will try to think as correctly as I can. I will read the sentence in German and then in English. Der Verstand bestimmt und hält die Bestimmungen fest. Die Vernunft ist negativ und dialektisch, weil sie die Bestimmungen des Verstands in nichts auflöst. Sie ist positiv, weil sie das Allgemeine erzeugt und das Besondere darin begreift. Now I will read the English translation. The understanding, which is der Verstand, determines and holds the determination fixed. Reason, which is die Vernunft, is, is negative and dialectical since it dissolves the determinations of the understanding into nothing. It is positive since it generates the universal and comprehends the particular therein. therein. I will comment just this sentence because this is the most difficult in, in Hegel, I guess. And in order to understand what der Verstand is, one has to study Kant. And I will comment um, briefly, of course, the, 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 the logical functions of the understanding in judgment in Die Kritik der reinen Vernunft. And Kant divides um, the functions of what he calls der Verstand. And I think that der Verstand is uh, to Hegel what it is to Kant. So in the works of Hegel, whenever Hegel says der Verstand, in my view, I may be wrong, but I imagine that he means the mind of Kant, not the empirical individual named Immanuel Kant, but the transcendental ego. So, in the Critique der Reinen Vernunft, uh, the transcendental ego is divided into four moments in the, in the logical table of judgments. There is uh, the moment of qu the quantity of judgments, the quality of judgments, the relation of judgments, and the modality of judgments. And I have made illustrations <coughs> Uh, from a quantitative point of view, judgments can be universal, particular, or singular. And the classical example of a universal judgment is all men are mortal. A particular judgment, some men are mortal. A singular judgment, Socrates is mortal. Then, in the realm of quality, uh, a, 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 an affirmative or positive judgment is, for instance, Germany is a European country. A negative judgment is a book is not a car. And an infinite, unendliche, in German, judgment, it's not very clear, but Kant gives an example, and an illustration somewhere in his logic. He says that to say that the soul is not mortal is an infinite judgment. So for him, there's a difference between saying the soul is immortal and to say the soul is not mortal. It's not very clear to me, but that's what Kant says. Then in the realm of relation, there are categorical um, judgments when um, a predicate is united with a subject. If I say music, is a form of art, this is a categorical judgment. Uh, and sculpture and painting 
are also forms of art or architecture or whatever, but if I say music is an art form, this is a categorical judgment. Then a, a hypothetical judgment, it's a relationship which is familiar today in uh, in informatic, in, in a computer uh, programming algorithm, it's if then. Uh, if a triangle has a right angle, then the square of the hypotenuse, hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two other sides. It's not very um, uh, lyrically pleasant, I guess, for an English person, but you get the idea. That's the, the theorem of Pythagoras. So if then. Uh, that's a form of relation of judgment. And then we have disjunctive judgments. An example is a human being is either a male or a female. That's classical logic. Uh, either A or B. When you, when you disjoin a totality into several parts, uh, this is a disjunctive judgment. And then in the realm of modality, the modality of judgments, we have uh, problematic judgments, assertoric judgments and apodictic judgments. An example of a problematic, it expresses the possibility this person might be English. Maybe he's Scottish, but he might be English. He may be English. Um, an assertoric judgment means to assert what is. The Earth is a planet. Maybe it's not, but <laughs> who knows? Um, and then apodictical judgments means to express the necessity of the judgment. A, a square has four sides and four right angles. It is necessary because it is in the very definition, the very mathematical necessity of a square to have four sides and four right angles. So yeah, this is the table of judgments, the functions that our transcendental ego, which is our thinking mind, uses when he, when we think, according to Kant. And Hegel criticizes this table of judgments. And for instance, he says, why do you begin with quantity instead of quality? And here I must take side with Hegel. I do not understand what Kant begins with quantity and not with quality. That's a mystery to me, but yeah. And a little later in the Critique der Rhein und Vernunft, we have the famous table of categories which is derived from the table of judgments. Kant extracted the, 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 the judgments of classical logic and, and derived from them the categories which are the, the, the ontological classes into which we categorize being. According to Kant, our transcendental ego is equipped, is programmed with a set of 12 categories uh, divided into four moments, quantity, quality, relation, modality, and whatever uh, we experience through our senses, we, our transcendental ego, classifies being through the mediation of the category. So uh, according to Kant, we experience the world, the phenomena, being, existence, through the mediation of the, the logical structure of our mind. And the categories of Kant are, in the moment of quantity, unity, plurality, totality. And a totality is a unity which contains within itself a plurality. And the, the classical example is that um, a pile of bricks is a plurality. A house is a totality because it's a unity of plurality. The bricks are ordered in a unity when you build a house. A pile of bricks, it's just a plurality. Then <clears throat> the moments of quality, there is reality, negation, and limitation. So what is real, what is not real, and, and the limit between the two. So here again, I have read Hegel, and Hegel is more logical, I would say, because Hegel says that Dasein, which is limited being, uh, is one with its negation, and that is reality. It's the unity of Dasein and negation. So Hegel is more um, a more profound thinker than Kant. Then there are the categories of relation. They go in pairs, in, in, in unity. 
a pair of a unity of a pair. There is inherence and subsistence, which is uh, inherence and, and subsistence in Latin. It's substantia and accidents. So substance and accidents. That's a classical category in metaphysics. The substance and its accidents. For instance. Uh, the classical example is that Socrates is the substance and whether Socrates has a beard or blue hair or whether he's sitting or standing up, these are accidents of Socrates, but the substance remains identical independently of the modification of its accidents. This is a category that we find in Spinoza also. Then there is uh, Ursache und Wirkung, um, causality and, and dependence, cause and effect, I guess. We constantly use uh, uh, the, the, the categories of cause and effect and, and the criticism of the category of cause and causality by David Hume is what forced Kant to, to think again and to, to, to be awakened from his dogmatic slumber as the, as the expression goes and, and Hume, because he criticized the category of causality uh, forced Kant to, to produce the Kritik der Heine und Vernunft, so to speak, which had an influence upon Hegel and so on and so forth. And then there is the, the community, Gemeinschaft, which is, which is a reciprocal determination between agent and patient, action and reaction. So these are the categories of relation, according to, to Kant. And then there are the categories of modality. Here again, they go in, in a pair possibility and impossibility. We constantly think about the world saying that things are possible or impossible. Dasein und Nichtsein, which is, uh, Dasein cannot be translated. It's not a proper translation to say existence because existence is different from Dasein. So there's Dasein and non-being, uh, what, what is and what is not, and Notwendigkeit, Zufälligkeit, necessity, and contingence. What is necessary is what is the way it is because it cannot be otherwise. What is contingent is what could be otherwise, what could be potentially different. Um, yeah. <laughs> A mathematical truth is necessary. Uh, but the, the, the figure that you draw on your paper to illustrate this or that triangle to illustrate the properties of a triangle is contingent. You could draw another another figure, but the, 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 the properties of the triangles are necessary. Yeah, that's why they are rational. So this is the the formal structure of der Verstand, which is the transcendental ego according to Kant. And the transcendental ego in the view of Kant is our mind, not the, the psychological mind, not the historical mind, not the biological mind. It's not in the brain. It's an abstraction which structures our very experience of the world. And I've read, um, not read, I've, I've stumbled upon a video by a French philosopher who said that the Kantian mind, when I say Kant, do not think about the, the, the empirical man, Immanuel Kant, the, the, the transcendental ego, if you will. The fact that the man who, who, who discovered the transcendental ego was named Immanuel Kant is kind of contingent. Or maybe it's not, but anyway. Uh, so this philosopher said that the transcendental ego and the table of categories, which is the, the software, in, in a way, the, the hardware would be the brain and the software would be uh, the transcendental ego with the, the, the table of judgments and the table of categories, he said, this French philosopher, that having studied Chinese thought, that it's a Western delusion, that this is just the projection of the Western mind, and that the transcendental self, the transcendental ego, as brought forth by Kant, is just a Western delusion, and that in other parts of the world, they do not use the same categories. And uh, the category of substance, for instance, is not universal according to, the, as we understand, as Kant understood this category, it's not strictly universal. So that's a question. Uh, is Immanuel Kant a Western philosopher influenced by Western metaphysics or is he a universal thinker? That's a good question. And, and obviously Hegel believed that Kant was not strictly universal because otherwise Hegel would not have felt the need to reshape and restructure 
uh, the Kantian mind, so to speak. So, I don't know who is going to watch this video, but whenever Hegel says der Verstand, and whenever I say der Verstand, or the understanding in English, maybe I'm wrong, honestly, because that's really complicated. That, that's really uh, the, 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 the most difficult thoughts in, in, in philosophy. That's, that's serious thinking. And I am just me. I'm just limited as an empirical individual. And I can, I can try to concentrate and focus and think and reflect, but it is really difficult. And what I understand whenever I read the word der Verstand in Hegel, I understand the mind of Kant, not the empirical history of Immanuel Kant, but the mind of their transcendental um, ego, the transcendental ego in the Critique der Heine and Vernunft. And Hegel was critical of der Verstand. So now I will reread the, the sentence that I am about to comment. I reread in English the understanding. Der Verstand determines and holds the determination fixed through quality, quantity, relation, modality. Reason is negative and dialectical since it dissolves the determinations of the understanding into nothing. So, die Vernunft, which is a higher faculty of the mind, dissolves the determinations of Der Verstand. It negates. But it, not, it, it does not negate in a purely negative way because, as, as we said, it is positive since it generates the universal and comprehends the particular therein. And honestly, this is really difficult, but I have tried to illustrate with three moments. The first is the purely abstract in the way I understand uh, this der verstand is abstract because it extracts it draws forth it takes apart it brings away you can use the vocabulary that you want it extracts a single determination and to determine is to negate it is to affirm to assert what is determined is positive but it is also negative because it is the negation of that which it that which it is not um, how to express this? Uh, uh, if I say a book, that's already a, de de a determination because a book is an object made of, of with a purpose, made of, of matter, etc. But if I say a book, it's an indeterminate object. If I say uh, die Kritik der reinen Vernunft, this is much more determined and it negates all other books. So determination is partly negation. And Hegel quoted Spinoza for having said that. So, der Verstand determines an, an abstract at the same time because der Verstand is the faculty of the mind which brings forth one aspect of an object and leave aside the other aspect. Die Vernunft, uh, in its uh, negative moment, in its dialectical moment, is the, the faculty of the mind which shows or proves or I don't know how to express this that this abstraction this abstract determination of der Verstand turns into its own negation it negates itself because precisely it is abstract so it is the negation of the abstraction and the abstraction is a negation it is a negation of a determinate concrete object so the, the negative moment of reason die Vernunft, is the negation of the negation the dialectical moment and then the result of this double negation is not nothing it is a, a concrete uh, moment a positive moment which uh, grasp within itself the universal and the particular this is quite confusing I know but it's difficult for me and and <laughs> maybe it was difficult for Hegel himself because we are we are in 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 the most complex uh, faculties of the mind, and to simplify, the the the, the famous <coughs> uh, formal aspect of Hegel repeated over and over again is 
thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But we never find this in Hegel. Uh, the, the real, so to speak, the, the, the formal aspect of Hegel's thought is abstraction, negation, concrete. Abstraction is the moment of der Verstand, negation is the dialectical moment of die Vernunft, and concrete is the positive uh, conceptual moment of die Vernunft. That's the formal aspect of Hegel. Now, I will try to illustrate in the realm of conceptual thinking by using Hegel's logic itself with the concept of something. The, the, der Verstand, which is the ordinary mind, thinks something is something. Seems obvious, right? What would something be if not something? So something is something, right? That's what der Verstand thinks. So something is finite. It is limited precisely because something is something. It means that something is not something else. It has a limit. It is finite. <clears throat> But that's how, when things start to become complicated, because Der Verstand says something is something, and reason investigates and, and asks Der Verstand, are you sure that something is something? Because the way I see things, something, because it is finite and, and limited and determined by something else, that which is not something, the something else is a moment of the something. It is the limit. It is <clears throat> the other. So... You cannot really think about something without thinking about something else, because something else is that which gives something its, its own identity. So, something else is something. It is part of the being of something. And to make things intelligible, this is how we, we, we go from the realm of the finite, something is finite, but if something is not just something, as Der Verstand believed, but also something else, it means that something does not cease to be what it is in its otherness, in something else. So if something is something and something else, it is not finite, it is infinite. And the unity of something and something else is the infinite. And this is a, a, a moment in the process and the unfolding and the development of Hegel's logic. So. That's an illustration of dialectical, rational, in the sense of vernunftisch thinking. And <laughs> I can imagine an Anglo-Saxon person watching this video. Because the Anglo-Saxon, they do not understand German speculative philosophy. And a, a typical Anglo-Saxon understanding this, this apparently nonsensical babbling about something and something else must think... This is nonsense. <laughs> the Germans are completely insane. But yeah, that's quite comical. I, I can't stop laughing and I can't help but laugh when I think about this. But anyway, now I will try to illustrate in a more concrete example, not with something and something else, but with identity and difference. And I have already in most of my videos, not most, but in many of my videos, I have already talked about this, but I try to make it intelligible. Let us talk about the left and the right in the political sphere in the modern Western world. Because what is the point of studying logic and speculative philosophy if it's just a waste of time in the sphere of whatever speculation? It has to, to help one understand the world. So the left in the Western world defends uh, in the name of universality the identity of all human beings. Because to simplify, a leftist says all human beings are identical in the sense that they all participate in the universal idea of mankind or humanity. So all humans are particular and singular determinations of the platonic idea of mankind. They do not express in such a way, but that's the idea that almost all leftists share that humans are not blacks, whites, Asians, whatever, they are humans. But in the name of this identity of all humans, the left defend the right to difference. Because if all 
humans are different, um, are identical, it means that uh, one should tolerate and accept and include the differences within the human species. So we should tolerate uh, Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, Africans, whatever, uh, males and females, transgenders, whatever. So this is Hegelian logic because the left defends the right to difference to have one's own particular identity, ethnic, sexual, gender, whatever, in the name of identity. So identity becomes difference. And the problem with the left is that they defend this universality, but in a particular set of countries. These are only the white leftists who defend universality. They do not defend universality and the right to, to difference and to identity and basically to immigration and tolerance and inclusion in all countries. They do this in only white countries and white countries are particular countries. Uh, Western countries are European countries, Northern American countries and uh, Australia and so on and so forth, but they are not the whole world. So there's a contradiction within the left uh, because if uh, a right-winger said, okay, you want the right to inclusion tolerance, then what is the difference between if, if what if uh, uh, tens of thousands of whites suddenly decided to, to, to settle uh, in, in some African countries and some Arab countries or some Asian countries, you would call this imperialism and colonization. But aren't all humans equal and universal and identical? So that's a contradiction because the left defends universal principles in particular countries, only white countries. So this contradiction in the, in the leftist discourse creates its own opposition, which is the right, and I'm here talking about the right in, 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 in Western countries, the right broadly defends the right um, to, to, to difference, to differentiate themselves from the left and to differentiate themselves from the other, whether they are defined in terms of culture or ethnicity or race, uh, the right defends uh, a different culture, uh, a different civilization, Western civilization against as against the Muslim civilization or whatever, or, or European culture or, or a, a Western culture as against leftist, universalist culture or whatever, or the white race against Hispanics or blacks or um, Asians or whatever. So they, they, they defend their difference. And this, this, this struggle to defend one's difference is called identity politics. So the difference is the right to have one's own particular identity. And the logic of identity politics is separation and basically apartheid. What white nationalists want is a new apartheid to create a white ethnostate, basically. So uh, identity and difference are in a conceptual unity. But the contradiction does not stop there. It continues because the right uh, wingers in the Western world, whites, basically, are seeking uh, what diff they want to differentiate themselves from the universalist, globalist, tolerant left. And by, by, by seeking to establish their own difference, they are seeking their identity. Who are we? Who, who are we? Um, Huntington wrote a book. William Pierce wrote a book. Who we are? What is our identity? Jared Taylor wrote wh White Identity. Uh, there are many books about European identity, Western identity, white identity, whatever. And by seeking their identity as whites, which means Europeans, they will discover that the identity of Europeans, the historical identity of Europeans throughout the whole of history is to promote universality. Europeans are a particular group of people. They are opposed as Europeans to Africans, Asians, and all other uh, racial or ethnic groups. But the particularity, the, what, the specificity, what distinguishes 
Europeans from all other groups throughout the entire history, intellectual and spiritual of, 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 of the European race, is that Europeans have constantly promoted universality. So the European people is the particular people which always tends towards universality. And to illustrate this, Europeans have, in a history of, of thought, developed logic through Aristotelian logic, which is the formal um, structure of, of the thinking mind, and it has had an influence upon, of course, Western history, but also upon the Arab world. Uh, mathematics, most great mathematicians in ancient times and, and still to, the, to this day are white Europeans. The greatest physicists, physical theor theoretical physicists, are and have been whites for 3,000 years, for two and, and 2,500 years now. Uh, chemistry, most of the great chemists are white Europeans and mathematics, logic, physics, chemistry, they are they have been accidentally, contingently developed by white males, mostly. But the, the truth of, of logic, mathematics, physics, and chemistry is universal. Biology, Darwin and the great biologists, most of them are white Europeans. But the, the truth of biology is universal. And the same goes for the social sciences and, finally, for philosophy uh, itself. So these right-wingers, they want unconsciously to solve the contradictions of the left, so they are, they are pushed by, by the, 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 the contradictions of the left towards seeking uh, their identity, but they will end up discovering that what characterizes, what uh, distinguishes Europeans from all other is precisely universality. So after having gone through the, the right-wing path, they will go back to the leftist mindset of promoting universality, but uh, they, will, they will have been uh, conceptually changed, I guess, by the process. So you go from left to right to left again, but you, you, uh, the left that you discover by returning to the left is not the same because it has been um, enriched, so to speak, by the right. And the unity of the left and the right is the truth because identity and difference are identical, as Hegel would say. So that's an illustration of Hegel's logic. And uh, yeah, honestly, this is very difficult. Um, but um, I'm doing <clears throat> what I can with my limited faculties. But um, yeah, that's um, what I could do.